So first, um, as we start the analysis, let's try, to, let's try to look at the composition of the labor force in our model, in this um, divine beverage Samuelson model. So here, very much like in the analysis of efficient tunnel problem, we are going to take the uh, size of the labor force as exogenous. <clears throat> so that is, um, the government intervention is not going to have, you know, the amount of um, workers that are hired by the government would have no effect on the size of the labor force. So that's just, you know, it, you know, we could assume that it changes over time, but it's not influenced by policy, and so it's not going to um, feature into the welfare analysis. So labor force size is exogenous. Uh, it's something, so a lot of this analysis here is uh, based on the paper that I wrote with um, Emmanuel Saez in 2019. Um, and there in the paper, we have an extension in which we look at distortionary taxation that's going to affect um, participation in the labor force. Um, and so you can actually show the results um, evolve if you do that. But here, you know, we're going to abstract from that and, you know, we'll assume that uh, taxation is lonesome, so that it has no effect on uh, participation in the labor force. So we'll take the size of the labor force as exogenous. Um, so it's key to look at what, uh, how the labor force is composed, because then you know, the number of workers in different activity will immediately determine through a production function or the number of services they produce, and then this will enter um, the welfare function. So um, it's key to know like what workers are doing here. And um, we're going to have uh, four types of workers here. Um, so one, uh, as usual, because we have a, a beverage framework, so we have some unemployment, so we have a share, you, of workers is unemployed. And exactly like we did when we studied efficient unemployment, we assume that the workers that are unemployed, they, they don't produce anything, so they don't participate uh, to uh, welfare. So here, as we did before, uh, unemployment is, is completely wasteful. And so, if we're thinking in terms of production, what you what you can think is that uh, there is no home production, for instance, no home production by unemployed workers, which you know would be one natural way in which you could say that although they are unemployed, the unemployed workers participate to welfare. Is that if home production was a major part um, of what unemployed do, but in practice it doesn't look like it. It looks like unemployment um, is very much wasteful. Uh, we don't see you know, home production by an employed worker very much at all. Um, and so here, you know, uh, we'll assume that unemployment is a perfectly wasteful, uh, completely wasteful activity. So we have U unemployed workers. Two, we'll have a share V of workers who are employed and recruiting. So as usual in these types of models with a beverage curve, um, you know, to recruit households, but also the government, they have to post vacancies and that requires to have a number of recruiters. And so, uh, and so here we'll assume that there's a share V of recruiters who are uh, employed on recruiting. And so two things to note here. So one is that workers uh, do not produce you know, um, kind of um, consumption uh, service that can be consumed when they recruit. As I don't, do not produce, we could say, consumable services when recruiting. So, of course, it's key to have recruiters for households to be able to hire workers who then will produce services that uh, provide utility. It's key for the government to have recruiter to then get workers who will provide public goods, but these recruiters in themselves do not produce services that are consumed or that provide welfare. That's one key thing. 
And the thing that's also uh, important to notice here uh, is that both households and the government, uh, you know, recruit in a similar way <coughs> and need recruiters to fill uh, vacancies and hire workers. So in a sense, the household, the government, they're perfectly symmetric here. They are on the same labor market. They all, um, those vacancies, these vacancies require a recruiter, and that's what you need to be able to uh, employ workers. <clears throat> Third thing that's key is that there is a beverage curve that's going to link the aggregate number of recruiters to the aggregate number of unemployed. The beverage curve V of U uh, links number of recruiters to numbers of unemployed workers. Um, so, you know, typically in practice, we don't measure recruiters, we measure the number of vacancies. Um, but here, you know, we'll just make the assumption that we've made earlier that one vacancy requires one recruiter, so that vacancies and recruiters are exactly the same. And so, we, you know, if we think in terms of labor, we can just have the beverage curve links recruiters to, uh, to, to job seekers. And then if we want to implement or observe that beverage curve in the real world, we can just look at vacancies versus job seekers. And uh, because we know, at least in the US, in the aggregate, that one vacancy roughly requires one recruiter. So uh, vacancies and recruiters are, um, you know, for practical purposes, they are just uh, the same thing. So here it's just easier to think about recruiters. Um, but in the US, one vacancy requires one uh, recruiter, so number of recruiters So number of recruiters can be measured by number of um, vacancies. But you know, for the story, let's just you know, let's not worry about uh, vacancies. Let's just focus on the number of recruiters. So key thing is that through the number of unemployed is going to affect the number of vacancies through the beverage curve. All right. So we have uh, so we have our U workers are unemployed, we have our V workers who are recruiters. Then we have uh, right. So then we have I guess uh, so we have one one minus U plus V workers are employed and um, producing services. So these are basically all the guys who are neither unemployed nor uh, recruiting. And then, so here what's new, because we're in a Samuelson framework, that we have two employers here. We have the households, the private employers, and we have the government public employers. And the guys who are employed in, by household pro produce private services, and the workers who are employed by the government pro produce public services. So we have two types of employers, and therefore, we have two types of services produced by workers, which is a novelty of the Samuelson framework, which allows for the type, specific types of services produced by the government, which will enter the utility function in a different, in a different way. So we'll denote by C. <coughs> C is a share. Uh, so let's say, uh, oops. So there is a share C of the labor force 
uh, employed by households and producing uh, private services. If you want, you could call this corresponds to private employment. Okay, and then there is a share which we'll call G. So in practice, the share, uh, right, the share G of the labor force that's employed by the government. and producing public services, so services that are going to be enjoyed by everybody. So G is basically public employment. Okay. And C plus G is total uh, productive yeah so here when I said earlier private employment of course there is also some recruiters that are employed by firms so this is I should have said this private productive employment and similarly this is public productive uh, employment. Uh, so, and C plus is total productive employment. So, this is the total amount of workers who are employed and producing services that enter the utility function, and that's 1 minus U plus V. Uh, and so, another way to say it is that C private productive employment is 1 minus U plus V minus G. So that actually is uh, an important relationship. And you can see, so private productive employment, you have to subtract uh, non-productive employment. Uh, you know, non-productive, I guess, it's not even employment, it's non-productive use of labor, which is both recruiting and job seeking. And then you have to subtract, of course, uh, you have to subtract public employment. And, and that gives you private, you know, productive employment. Public. So, and so this is basically showing you this. Um, you know, when I was saying that fiscal policy is, is not, um, you know, should be used second after monetary policy because it creates distortion. This is a distortion that I'm talking about that. Um, when you increase G, uh, when the government decides to provide more public services, through this, this resource constraint, the fact that the size of the labor force is fixed, you're going to deplete the amount of um, employment that can be, uh, you know, that can be allocated to private production. So this is, you know, these are the distortions that this is a distortion that I was talking about. This is a distortion that's created. Uh, that's created by public employment. So you can see that, um, so of course, if you increase public employment, you're going to increase total employment, but uh, keeping non-productive use of labor fixed, that's going to reduce uh, private productive employment. So there'll be a trade-off, you know, you cannot just, uh, you'll be a trade-off between private, the private and the public use uh, of labor that's going to show up in our uh, welfare analysis. So that's, and that's really at the heart of the Samuelson framework, that there is this trade-off, you know, if you have a certain amount of stuff that's produced, part of it would be private, you know, privately used, part of it would be publicly used, 
Um, but if you increase the publicly used, you will mechanically reduce the privately used. And so you have this interesting uh, Samuelsonian trade-off um, that's going to appear here. Uh, so we have that. Uh, 